Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zaina Lutfia, and I'm the acting director of the Morrow Institute here at St. Paul's College, University of Manitoba. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our first brown bag lecture of the 22-23 academic year. And I'll note, this is also the first time we're doing this synchronously, the same time in person and via Zoom. And my thanks to Jason Brennan for all of his work in making that possible. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of this series, Dr. Shell Anderson, who is the director of the Masters of Human Rights program and a faculty member in the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba. Uh, as you will see, the focus of Dr. Anderson's research is on mass atrocities, including genocide and international criminal justice. And today, he's going to be speaking about the story of a child soldier. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anderson. All right. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you also everybody online and especially my students. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm partial to my own students, but uh, thank you for coming anyway. And thank you of course to the Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice for hosting me today. So today I'm talking about Dominic Nguyen, uh, and Dominic Nguyen was someone who was a child who was abducted by the Ugandan rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army, and went on to become a commander in this group and was later convicted of actually 61 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Court. Uh, so I'm going to talk about his story, which I think is quite fascinating because one could reasonably say he would have never become a perpetrator had he not been a victim himself of some of the same crimes uh, that he was actually charged with and convicted of, in fact. So I'll briefly explore his case and the tensions it brings out. Uh, and just by way of background, I'll say something about the Lord's Resistance Army. I'm not going to go too deep, but some of you are probably not so familiar with the Lord's Resistance Army. But the Lord's Resistance Army was a rebel group in Uganda, which was formed in 1987 uh, by Joseph Kony, who continues, probably, continues to be the leader of the group until this day, though the group is no longer in Uganda. Uh, so it's essentially based in the alienation of northern Ugandans from the central government in Kampala, to make the long, complicated story very short and very simple. And they fought an insurgency basically from 1987 until now, although now they're very small. And Joseph Kony is kind of semi-retired, I would say, but nobody knows exactly where he is. Uh, but this insurgency was characterized by, really by mass atrocities and brutality, and especially by mass abduction, particularly of children. And these children went on to become fighters, especially in the case of male children and wives, uh, in quotation marks, especially in the case of the women who were abducted by the LRA, although all women were also fighters, which I think is something that's also overlooked often by the literature. So I'm going to ask and hopefully answer three questions today, or I'm going to answer the first two. I'm going to kind of punt the third one to all of you. But how did Dominic Nguyen become a war criminal? Uh, how did his trial account for his abuse? And I'll, I'll detail those abuses which, by the way, content warning, I mean, we're talking about, uh, yeah, very difficult, very extreme stuff. I mean, even for, for me, and I've studied these things for a long time and heard a lot of pretty appalling stories, but I try to be sensitive about the way I present them. And finally, yeah, we'll talk about how we can deal with similar cases or, or how we should deal with similar cases and, and how to kind of resolve this dilemma, which is also, by the way, the title, I think, at least right now of my forthcoming book. Uh, so I've done, I've been doing research on Dominic Nguyen well, for a while. It depends kind of on how you count it. I mean, I first went to Uganda in 2009, but I wasn't researching Dominic Nguyen at that time, but I was researching the Lord's Resistance Army. But basically I've been working on this book maybe for five years, six years, and it's based primarily on interviews with people who know Dominic Nguyen. So there are about a hundred interviews and counting uh, that are in the book. And so the largest part of these interviews are people who were in the Lord's Resistance Army, 
So these were some people, you know, ranging from people who were involved in his abduction, which was a very long time ago in 1987, to people that he abducted, officers in the Lord's Resistance Army, Army who were senior in the hierarchy to him, many people who were below him. I also interviewed victims of his crimes, particularly in two of the main case locations in Lukodi and Pajuli. And I've interviewed his family uh, from before he was abducted. I've interviewed several of his wives. And I've interviewed a lot of people involved in his trial, or at least some people involved in his trial. So we're talking about you know, defense counsel, people working for the office of the prosecutor, people working for the office of public counsel for victims, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of thing anyway. And that's what I'm basing uh, my talk on today as well. Oh, another important thing, I guess, in terms of my research is looking through the trial materials. And these are vast, <laughs> which is very common with international courts. It's, it's, it's almost really incomparable to domestic courts. So we're talking about just from the witnesses, we have something like 400 witnesses who testified in the trial. And just the witness transcripts amount to, I'm not sure, maybe 40,000 pages. Uh, so I've read or at least skimmed all of that. And then of course you have many motions, you have a lot of evidence, both documentary evidence as well as uh, other stuff. But we'll talk a bit about that as well. So that, that's what's going into what I'm talking about today. So how did he become a war criminal? Uh, maybe a deceptively simple question, and it will kind of explore it through the whole talk today. But I mean, the most straightforward answer is that he was abducted when he was nine years old, and he was on his way to school. Uh, perhaps before I get to that, I should say he was, he was from a village called Chirom, which is a very tiny village. I've, I've been to the village, in fact, as I said, spoken to some of his family members who are surviving. Um, yeah, so he was from Chirom. He was the son of a catechist. So he was the son of a religious person, had a very ordinary childhood up until this point. He was walking to school with three of his friends and they were all abducted, you know, at about seven o'clock in the morning in 1987. Uh, something that of course comes up in the trial, even though it's long before the period of the charges. So that's the simple answer, I suppose, as to how he became a war criminal. He would have never been a war criminal. Uh, I think it's, I think anybody would say that even the office of the prosecutor would say that as well had he not been abducted on the way to school. So I think, you know, as we start to explore his story, as I said, I, I think it's it's actually quite a heartbreaking story. I'm not sure what to make of it, and we'll, we'll talk about all that today. Uh, so when he was abducted, his sister was in town buying salt, and she returned to, to their home and found that he was missing. And she told me, and I'm reading a lot of quotations today, so apologies for that, but I think it also makes it interesting even though I have to read. She told me this incident really depressed me. I cried for one week. I could not eat. I did nothing for over a month. And when I was speaking with her, she also asked me if I would take her photograph to bring to Dominic and when, but she said to me that it might bring back painful memories. So she hadn't been in contact with him. Actually, she hadn't been in contact with him for 30 years or something like that, which was really true of pretty much his whole family. Actually, the trial brought them sort of back together, ironically, as they reached out to some of these people in the course of the trial. So he was really brought into a system which was designed to reproduce atrocities. That's what the system was for, the Lord's Resistance Army, and that's what it did. Uh, so on a very basic level, it would tear people down and then it would build them back up. So the tearing down aspect of things that's when we get into, you know, extreme hardship. So the Lord's Resistance Army was often, it was highly mobile, it was a guerrilla force for the most part. Uh, so often they didn't have enough to eat, they suffered all the matter of ailments. Of course, they were under danger in many cases where they were being shot at, you know, by the Uganda People's Defense Forces and, and other forces as well. Um, it was also a group where people were subject to really severe physical punishments up to and including death. And, and public executions for infractions within the group were not at all unusual, and they were done quite systematically. Um, people were also disoriented. You know, they were alienated from their families. Often they were told that their families were dead. In the case of Dominic Nguyen, his family was dead. Shortly after he was abducted, both of his parents were murdered in separate incidents, which are still a little bit hazy, by the way. The trial doesn't really shed much light onto that. Uh, 
Uh, then the building up aspect of thing, which I think is, again, I think it's somewhat underrepresented in the literature as well. But people would be placed into households, and I'll talk about this in terms of Dominic in a moment. But basically, they, they were put back in a family structure within the Lord's Resistance Army. So they essentially had parents, and they had mentors, or Lapuoni, which are teachers, and they would teach them you know, what it meant to be in the Lord's Resistance Army and how to follow the rules. They also underwent training. So just briefly, I guess chronologically, people would usually be abducted. Often at night, they would be tied tightly, bound by their wrists. They'd be tied at all the time, you know, and they'd be walking in a line. So even when they were sleeping, they'd be tied up. Uh, they had obviously no freedom. They were expected to carry very heavy loads because basically they were acting as porters. And when they would become more trusted by the group, then they would begin training to become fighters. So another aspect of this kind of building up of people, or I, I guess creating a community within the, within the LRA, was the, the spiritual beliefs of the group, which of course are quite famous or maybe infamous, <clears throat> which combined uh, elements of Christianity and Islam and also kind of local customary beliefs and other stuff, you can say. So Joseph Kony uh, was seen as, and still is pretty much, seen as a, a, a prophet, as a seer and a telepath, so he could read people's minds, he, could, he was a spirit medium, he could foretell the future, which also made people, I think, more afraid in terms of the consequences of plotting against Kony or trying to escape. Uh, I've also called the group a transgressive community, and, and what I mean by this is that people actually become bound together by acts of transgression because they become isolated from the normal kind of moral community, uh, forced to commit atrocious acts, uh, often as children. And this kind of shame actually binds them together because in a sense, they're the only people, maybe the only people who can understand each other. And this is often explicitly uh, stated to them as well, that they can't return to their communities. And sometimes they would force them, you know, to kill their own relatives and stuff like that to commit really, and worse. Commit, if you can get worse than that, but to commit really egregious acts. By the way, there's Dominic Ungwen uh, in the middle there, I should say. So uh, again, I apologize because we're getting into some, some very difficult stuff. But keep in mind, he was a nine-year-old boy at the time, and he was, he was so small that he often had to be carried, you know, as they were crossing rivers and whatnot. But in his first days, we could say maybe in the first few months in the LRA, uh, he was beaten, his friends were beaten uh, quite severely at times. He saw other people be beaten. One of the people who was training him, a man named Amoni, was killed in front of Dominic uh, Ongwen for trying to escape. Um, and Dominic Ongwen uh, was actually forced to kill somebody alongside two other people who had tried to escape. And then he was forced to wear the entrails of the victim around his neck. And then he was forced to ingest their blood. Uh, so this is what he experienced as a nine-year-old boy. So he talked about this uh, in the sentencing hearings of the trial because he gave an unsworn statement, which just means that he can't be cross-examined on that statement. It's him giving his views on his, uh, I guess, his perspective on what he had experienced. If you're interested, I would encourage you to watch it. I guess you could just Google it. Um, but he spoke at length. He spoke for maybe about an hour and a half. Of course, in a Choli in his language, but translated into English. So some of the things he said in this statement, I mean, he said about this, this incident I described, he said, I think I will go to the grave with that image in my mind. And he said later in the statement, my suffering has made me drunk. I cannot distinguish between day and night because I'm awake throughout. I get hallucinations. I hear gunshots. I hear people talking. I see dead bodies, people I killed. People I slaughtered, soldiers who I shot, I believe that image will not go anywhere until my death. Um, and the image of his trauma, or sorry, the, the issue of his trauma uh, is something that was, was also key in the trial, but we'll get to that later. Um, but some of this stuff, well, maybe I could talk about it briefly now, but I mean, some of this stuff seems like pretty typical post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of, you know, um, yeah, in terms of intrusive memories, 
I mean, that's what we would call this kind of stuff where he's seen dead bodies or hyper arousal. There was an incident in the detention center in The Hague where it was New Year's Eve and fireworks went off and he just completely freaked out uh, because it reminded him of being in combat. So one of the people that was with him when he was abducted actually testified in the trial. The, the other two people I think were dead. Uh, and this was a gentleman named Kakaniero Joe. So Kakaniero Joe spoke in the trial. He talked about the initiation rituals that they went through in the LRA. Uh, and he said that after these initiation rituals, he felt, I felt like I was lifeless. I was just feeling like I was no longer myself. And of course they asked him, well, what did you see of, of Dominic on when at that time? How was he responding to things? And he said he was really depressed, but he didn't have anything to do. We were, we were all children. It was very difficult. And the man in front there is, is Joseph Coney, by the way. So in his early days growing up in the group, as, as I mentioned, he would be placed within the household of a commander. Uh, in fact, he was in the household of several different commanders, and this was done deliberately. So Joseph Coney basically wanted your, your chief loyalty be, to be towards him. So he would actually move children around uh, so that they didn't form bonds too closely with any particular commander. And many of Angwen's Laponi, many of the households he was in, the commanders were killed, uh, usually in the course of battle. And this was not unusual in the LRA, which is also one of the reasons why he advanced so quickly through the group. You know, and by the time he was in his late, in his late teens, he was already a fairly senior commander in the group. And the period of charges is kind of when he was in his early 20s. Uh, but he also gained a reputation, as, as one of the people who was there told me, as a as a bad luck boy because all of his commanders were, were being killed. So I spoke to one of these commanders who was, who was raising Dominic Nguyen, partly, who was a senior commander in the LRA. And I asked him, why didn't you let him go? Because he expressed a lot of sympathy towards Nguyen, Nguyen's situation. By the way, this man is also not charged with any crimes. Um, and he said to me, he said it was quite hard returning him to his family. He has to have somewhere to begin from, just sending him home to begin from nowhere because he had no parents. Really, it was so painful. But truthfully, I don't think he ever really contemplated returning Dominic Nguyen. Not that he was unsympathetic, but he was deeply enmeshed in this system, as Dominic Nguyen would become deeply enmeshed in this system. So the thought of, doing, the thought of just letting somebody go, it, it, it just did not even really occur. And as one former child soldier told me, you know, I thought if, if I had these things, I'm paraphrasing, but if I had these things done to me, why shouldn't I do them to somebody else? And I asked one of the women who was married to one of these commanders, so she was kind of a proxy mother of Dominic Nguyen, I mean, one of several in the bush, um, which she remembered of him. And she told me he would listen to advice from elders. For instance, when we reached the park, I can't remember now if this is Kadepo or Garamba National Park, but basically remote areas of, of Central African Republic as well as Congo and Uganda. So I told him when we reached the park, I told him here it is dangerous. If you escape from here, you will not reach home. The animals will eat you. Others don't listen. They just escape and don't reach home. But for him, he used to listen and obey. And this is kind of a running theme. You know, when I, when I talk to people about Dominic Nguyen is that he was very dutiful. You know, even as a child, that he did what he was told. I told you his father was a catechist. He wasn't really overly strict, but Dominic Nguyen was essentially seen as, as a good boy by his relatives and quite studious. And when he was in the LRA after this initial period of trauma, he adapted fairly quickly, which of course comes up in the trial. And actually even one of the prosecution mental health experts said, I'm not sure if we should punish him for how well he was able to adapt to the group. But the other experts, of course, disagreed with, with this woman. Um, another commander who knew him at the time told me that he was a strong boy, but very, very innocent, as you would expect with you know, a nine-year-old, of course. Just a reminder, Dr. Anderson, that the, our audience can't see your slides, so don't don't allude to them. Oh, right. And apologies to the okay. audience. Uh, just a technical issue. We, we're not sorry, I forgot to about that. Today. Yeah, sorry about that. No, um, the slides aren't actually that crucial. It's nice to see pictures of people, but that's really the only the only thing. Apologies for that to the oh, audience. Not the yes, thank you. I forgot. Thanks for the reminder. So um, Dominic Nguyen, 
how did Dominic Nguyen become involved in atrocities? I, I told you already how the system would reproduce atrocities um, and also how he could be promoted so quickly through the system. And this was something that came up again in the trial and the kind of, the kind of uh, interpretation of the court was why didn't he leave? Because many other people did leave. But that's of course a complicated question and it's, it's a tricky it's a tricky sort of comparison to make, given that he was involved in sexual violence, but it's kind of like asking an abused woman, why don't you just leave your husband? Because he was deeply enmeshed in the system, uh, fearful, and his whole worldview was really transformed. But uh, he went on to commit many atrocities, you know, and these ranged, I won't go through the whole list, but it really ranged from sexual violence to conscription of child soldiers, and this was both as a as a direct perpetrator and as a commander to attacks on civilians. So the LRA operated as a kind of a, a closed system in the sense that it was isolated from the outside world and the values within the, the LRA had its own values and its own internal logic, uh, which I think a lot of people also don't quite understand. Maybe we can understand actually what it was like really to be in that group, which is nevertheless one of the things that the court is, is kind of asked to do so, yeah, in talking about how these values were internalized, I could use examples of other people who were with him in the group at the same time. So I was interviewing a group of women who were all in forced marriages, and they were all victims of the LRA, and they all knew Dominic Nguyen personally. And they, you know, they were telling me positive things. They were saying he was nicer than many of the other commanders. This was also quite typical, and it should be approached with a bit of caution. But then I said, you know, when I would get more specific, I said, did you ever see him do anything bad? And one of the women said, yes, he ordered me to be stabbed with a bayonet. And so I said to this woman, I said, well, you must have a different view of him. You know, he ordered you to be stabbed with a bayonet. This was after she had attempted escape, which again was a very typical scenario in terms of being punished. And, and she said, no, she said he wasn't a bad person. He was just following orders. So what do we make of this? Is it is it kind of Stockholm syndrome, as some people have said, or is it, is it just her considering the whole context? I'm not sure, but it is, there is this deep internalization uh, of the values of the group. Another example was a, a former child soldier that I talked to who was abducted by Dominic Nguyen, and he went by the name of Cowboy, that was his nom de guerre, and he told me that Dominic Nguyen was like a father to him. So this is decades down the line, and this is somebody who was now well-educated, um, so I was just interviewing him in his house, in fact. But he said he was like a father to me, and he said he taught me, quote, to love fighting, to fight like you've never fought before, and as if there's no fighting tomorrow. And I asked him, um, I asked him obviously about his views of Ang Wen, and he was, he was also, you know, quite conflicted. But I, I think one of the really interesting, interesting things about what he said Actually, I'll give you a concrete example just to continue this. Um, so he was talking to me a lot about combat and what it was like fighting. And I could see that he was getting really excited by talking about fighting and about battle. He'd earlier in the interview talked to me about, you know, really horrific punishments that he suffered, about being abducted and all the rest. But then I saw his excitement level rising as he was talking about battle. So he said to me, indeed, when you go and attack the barracks, you win. It was our joy. And so I said, so it was exciting. And he said, it was very exciting. There was a time when we brought down a helicopter around Atiak, a town in Northern Uganda. It was all fun. It was really joy. We stayed there for two days with a disco. So, I mean, and we all kind of started laughing at this as we were doing the, as we were doing the interview. And even he was laughing. He was thinking, this is crazy in a way, but I could see at the same time that he still, in fact, he had some nostalgia <laughs> for being a child soldier, you know, and he was abducted at the age of 13 by Dominic Nguyen. And I also asked him if he'd ever, if Dominic Nguyen ever committed atrocities. And he was adamant, no, he never committed atrocities. But then, you know, later on, I would come back to it from a different angle and say, uh, well, did you ever see him kill anybody? Did you ever see him kill a prisoner? And then he, yeah, then he would explain to me in some detail that he saw him torture and kill, you know, a captured soldier, for example. Uh, you know, he told me in quite gruesome detail, and he recounted several of these incidents. But the important part here is that he, even years later, he actually didn't see those as atrocities. Because within the context of the LRA, that was legitimate violence within the group. 
So let's get to his trial, and I want to leave time for questions here. So that's, oh, you can't see the image. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you can easily Google Dominic Nguyen. You'll find exactly the same picture, an image of him on trial. Actually, one of the interesting things, of, you know, there are many interesting things about the trial, but it's how much his, his image actually changed throughout the course of the trial. Uh, because he, in the detention center, he put on a lot of weight, which I think was partly lifestyle change and partly antidepressants. And um, yeah, he was very different. He looked pretty haggard by the end of the trial. Anyway, so how did this case come to the International Criminal Court? Uh, well, there was actually, before I get to that, I should say there was an Amnesty Act in Uganda in 2000. And the Amnesty Act basically gave everybody amnesty who was involved in the LRA insurgency. And this was very effective in getting people to leave the bush. So even Nguyen would have been given amnesty at that time, but you, have, you had to leave the LRA, of course, to, to benefit from amnesty. But a few years later, the case was referred by Uganda. It was a self-referral referred by Uganda to the International Criminal Court. And um, yeah, there was a lot of discussion about the amnesties, whether the amnesties should be respected. And the International Criminal Court took the position that those are, those are national law. They have nothing to do with us. So basically, they indicted, or I should say they charged. Uh, indictment isn't the correct term to use at the ICC. But they charged five individuals. They charged Dominic Nguyen, Joseph Kony, uh, Raskin Lukuya, Okal Odiambo, and Vincent Otti. Vincent Otti was also one of Nguyen's mentors, and he was also, uh, yeah, he was also executed, in fact, which is part of the reason why Dominic Nguyen had a, had a falling out with Joseph Kony. But that's, that's a much longer story that you can maybe, maybe eventually read about in my book. Um, yeah, so the case was referred in 2004. So I spoke to people who were involved in the case and in the investigation uh, about how did you arrive at Dominic Nguyen, because they basically chose, they decided they were going to pick five people. And they were, at that time, Luis Moreno Ocampo was the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And he, <laughs> he, had, he had some particular idiosyncrasies, but he was very conscious of his image. This was early days in the court, and he was very anxious to get charges against people because they had no cases. And he was under pressure. He was under pressure from the states, from donors. He was under pressure from the judges, saying, we have nothing to do. We're collecting this massive salary. We have nothing to do. Uh, so he had to get cases quickly. So he gave the investigators a month, essentially, once they had the Ugandan referral. So they had a month to decide who was going to be charged by the court. And they decided on Dominic Nguyen among these other four individuals, three of whom are, are now dead. Uh, Kony is the only one who's still alive, and he's still at large. But the investigator, he was the head of the investigation, told me there were so many options. I'm 100% sure there were other people we could indict. Actually, he's using the wrong term. There were other people we could indict who were on, maybe on a higher level than Nguyen was. So it's, it's arguable. He was definitely a senior commander. It, it also depends on the period we're talking about. We're talking about 2002 to 2004, essentially. So it was different at different times. A lot of people had died in action, you know, who were responsible for atrocities before. But basically, they got good evidence on Ungwen relatively quickly, and that's why he was taken. But it's there were a couple that they had to get. They had to get Kony. They had to get Vincent Oti, who was the number two of the LRA. Uh, and the, I'd say the other three were pretty interchangeable. And some of those who were not charged, like Baka Abu Dema, these names probably won't mean anything to you, but Baka Abu Dema, another senior commander, was angry when Dominic Nguyen was charged. He said, why wasn't I charged? Because it actually, it kind of reduced his stature. He said, I'm, I'm a commander. I've done a lot of things. I'm way worse than Dominic Nguyen. Uh, so anyway, that was kind of the discussion at the time. Nguyen himself was, uh, was very unhappy about the charges and, and thought that they were unfair, as he, I guess, continues to think to this day. So the key evidence in the trial uh, were basically two things. There were insider witnesses, well, witnesses, but especially insider witnesses. So these were people who were in the LRA, many of whom were responsible actually for the same atrocities as Unwen. Some of the people in, involved in his abduction were testified against him in the trial, which is also, there's, a, there's an, an irony there or a paradox there. Uh, and then you had radio intercepts. So the Ugandan, well, there were three government bodies engaged in intercepting radio communications to the Lord's Resistance Army. And that was also really powerful evidence <clears throat> because you would get Dominic Nguyen reporting to Kony on the radio, saying, I just went to this village, I burned down all the houses, 
that's powerful stuff if you play it in a chord. And the kind of the only argument against that is really the provenance of the intercepts. Were they correctly translated? Did somebody doctor the communications? But it's it's a, it's a long shot, and it, it didn't stick uh, in terms of the defense. So the prosecution, of course, argued that he was an eager perpetrator. Actually, in their opening statement, they already mentioned mitigation and sentencing, which I also found quite interesting. They mentioned it again in their closing statement. So they were cognizant very much of the fact that he was a child soldier, a former child soldier. But their basic argument was, hey, he was a child, but then he became an adult and he did all these things. And we're only charging him for things he did as an adult. They can't charge him for things that he did when he was under 18. The court doesn't have uh, jurisdiction over people under 18. But so they argued he was an eager perpetrator, essentially. The defense said that he was a victim, full stop, that he'd always been a victim, he never stopped being a victim, and that he, everything he did was merely to, to survive in the group and to continue within the group. Probably both reductionist perspectives, as you would imagine, an adversarial trial. The key defenses, of course, were mental illness and duress, uh, which I could talk about at length. I don't think I will, but maybe it'll come up in questions. But the defense alleged that he had a whole range of mental illnesses. And of course, this is where expert witnesses come in. So they said he had PTSD. They said he had dissociative identity disorder. They said he had uh, severe depressive episodes, that he had other trauma disorders, anxiety disorders. They, they said he had a lot of stuff. And the prosecution said he had no mental illnesses, full stop. And of course, there's also an issue of, there are two separate issues that people can Get confused about and that's whether he was mentally ill then and whether he's mentally ill now but they're both relevant for the trial but in both cases they found that he wasn't mentally ill and the judges uh the judges went with that and i think the prosecution actually had much better experts than the defense did but the chamber experts uh so the judges also appointed an expert to talk about fitness to stand trial and who i think i'm going to interview by the way i'm, I'm working on which would be really interesting and he said Dominic Unguin had the, the most severe case of PTSD he'd ever seen. Um, but the judges said, no, he's got nothing, actually. He doesn't have any mental illnesses. Um, so he was convicted of 61 counts, which is the most by anybody in international court ever, in fact, of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And again, the court, uh, they really adopted the narrative of the prosecution that he committed crimes as a fully responsible adult, that his, uh, I think a really important point is that socialization was completely irrelevant. And probably they arrived at the right decision from a criminal law standpoint, which is I think one of the conundrums because they're talking about what happened at the time of the crimes. They're not so concerned about how he got to where he got. Uh, and should they be, I think is an interesting question as well. But basically they said none of that stuff matters. They were very skeptical about about duress within the Lord's Resistance Army, and they thought nobody actually believed that Coney had magical powers, which I think was so wrong. <laughs> actually, having interviewed you know dozens of these people, um, the belief is very prevalent. But I think the court misinterpreted. I mean, you imagine, you know, people sitting in the Hague. We had a judge from the Philippines, a judge from Germany, and one from uh, Czech Republic or Czechia, I guess it's called now, sitting in the Hague trying to. You know, talking about spirit possession, talking about Delaray also had a belief in something that's kind of like a, a natural law of cosmic consequence. That's not a very elegant way to put it, but if you did, if you violated a rule, you would receive corresponding punishment from the universe. So, for example, if you raped somebody out of the course of forced marriage, forced marriage it was of course allowed, then you might be shot in your genitals. You know, in the context of a battle. Um, but people really believe this, and in my experience, a lot of them believe it even years later. So I think it's important to remember, I think, that criminal trials are a process of, of fact-finding. Um, but there are a lot of kind of, I guess, positivist and normative claims about the power of the law to kind of uncover facts and make definitive judgments. But I think it's important to remember that criminal trials are also processes of exclusion. You know, they're constantly narrowing the scope and saying this is what's important, this is what's not important. So I spoke to, to a prosecution lawyer, for example, one of the trial lawyers, and he declined to, to do an interview with me. But in declining to do the interview, I thought his email was actually really interesting. <laughs> and in his email, he'd read some of my blog posts that I'd written about the trial. 
And he said, from what I've read of your stuff, you're keen to put the trial into context. And he always put context in quotation marks. As a trial lawyer, I'm just a craftsman. Prosecuting, defending, it's all the same to me. A case to be argued. I leave the context to you pointy-headed academic fellows. So there was, yeah, there was a bit of disdain there as well. Uh, and you get it from the rest of the email, believe me, a lot str more strongly. But I actually, found it, it, I actually found it quite interesting as well because he, he was kind of encapsulating this, this idea of the, the purity of the law. And there are some good reasons for that purity, but there are also, there are also problems. So finally, just moving to, to discussion here as well. I guess the question then, how do you deal with the situation like this? Is a trial the best way to deal with it? I've talked a lot about Dominic Nguyen from a somewhat sympathetic angle, but also what about his victims? And he had victims and he had people who suffered a lot, in fact, um, and some of whom were, were obviously quite critical of him, needless to say. But what do, we, what do we do with those people? What's the best way to address a situation like this, where somebody is a, also a victim of the crimes that they were um, themselves convicted of, which is also not totally unusual in the domestic context. You know, if you think of somebody who's a pedophile, for example, it's very common that they suffered sexual abuse themselves, but that doesn't exclude criminal responsibility. But I, so I guess that's my question. I, I return back to the audience is, what do we do in these kinds of situation? Uh, like in some sense, I think, there was a kind of web of suffering in northern Uganda, and, and Dominic Nguyen was kind of caught up in that web, but he also brought other people into that web, and maybe, you know, from a more kind of, uh, I guess, a law-centric approach, maybe you could say the trial helps to break that web, but at the same time, there is this arbitrariness to the targeting. You know, I asked, again, I asked the prosecution, you know, did you ever think of taking more people when some of them died, and they said, no, no, no. We'd already moved on. Then we got the Darfur case. Ocampo was far more interested in Darfur because it was a head of state, so he stopped being interested in Uganda at that time, essentially. So I'll just leave it at that and, and return uh, these questions back to you. So thank you, everybody. I come from Peru, and we have the Chinese part over there. Luckily, there are a couple of well-documented cases of uh, abduction of child soldiers that uh, after years they could manage to escape from the movement. And I have this doubt, uh, maybe you can shed some light on this, is uh, what is the difference of a, for a child soldier, if any, between being physically abducted and being buried inside a guerrilla's group because I think in the end of the day they both ended up being uh, psychologically abducted but there must be some differences mm -hmm. so you mean in terms of, of socialization or something like that or just in terms of uh, being capable to live or escape from the right. group and also in terms of uh, Reintegration process, right? Yeah, and a, and a lot of people were born in, inside the LRA, yeah. as you said as well. Which are, I mean, clearly they're also victims at the same time. I don't know what the difference is. It's an interesting question. I mean, people have talked about how long you're in the group. You know, if you're in the group longer. I mean, Dominic Nguyen was in the group for sometimes like 25 years or so. You know, does that make a difference in terms of how you absorb the values? Presumably, it does. You know, and how young you are at the time, I would imagine you have more resilience uh, if you're an adult, you know, versus a child. And the prosecution experts, uh, the mental health experts, to me, argued some, some very unusual things in terms of forensic psychiatry, but that's kind of how forensic psychiatry is. That they said, basically, your moral values are all formed by the age of nine, which is a convenient... <laughs> But my sister is a, a neuropsychologist, and I talked to other psychologists and, I, and psychiatrists, and I said, is that true? And of course, I've read some things, and, and they basically say, no, that's not true, or at least it's, it's not really a mainstream view in psychiatry. Even neurologically, your brain is still developing over time, and there's a lot of evidence, actually, that trauma, uh, well, I think it's pretty proven, actually, that trauma can actually physiologically change your brain especially extreme trauma, and, and 
you know, things like PTSD also tend, I mean, there are issues with PTSD, that's a whole other discussion. There are issues with the, the DSM manuals, uh, that's another discussion. But even uh, PTSD, for example, is also usually said to be related to the dose of trauma you receive, to put it in really simple terms. So he received a big dose right off the bat, and he continued to experience trauma throughout his whole time in the group. So I don't know, in your example, it's difficult to say, would you be more used to it if you were born into the group, but at the same time, having your life threatened <laughs> is always unpleasant. You know, even if you're born into a group where such things take place, that's, I don't think you can shrug a lot of these things off, but maybe there's less of a, a shock in terms of being removed from one thing to another thing. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, in one of the cases in, in, in Peru, one of the childs that was uh, abducted uh, when he was, I mean, like a maybe, he was part of a, he was a member of a tribe in the jungle, and basically all the tribe was abducted. And he spent a lot of time, you know, in the, in the group, and he tells in his story that uh, he always wanted to escape because it was tough. The, I mean, the, the treatment was really awful inside the group. Uh, he was basically living all the time with these atrocities. But also, on the other side, he was really afraid of the army. I mean, he mm, thought it would be more difficult for him, and even, you know, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, you know. So it was a kind of a dilemma for him. If he was in the right place, with the right people, with the right ideas, fighting an enemy that uh, he feared most. You know? So it was kind of crazy, you know, it was like yeah. a vice yeah, the vicious was, cycle. It was very much like that as well. And there was definitely an indoctrination about the central government and the army. But the army did kill a lot of people. You know, especially before the Amnesty Act, if you escaped, you might be killed. You know, you escape and you find the army, you might be raped and you might be killed. And that was that was a very that was a real fear for good reason. That changed a bit over time as, as the government took a different tact, but a, a lot of people were killed and escaped, which is also a really important point. Yeah, Doctor, I have my question is on the technicality of the trial, since there is also one commander that was not impleted, because there is a concept, I'm pretty sure, of a conspiracy, where in the act of one is the act of all. So would the judgment against Dominic and Wen apply to other commanders as well, since there is a concept of conspiracy? Yeah, if they had them. I mean, if they had Joseph Coney, they would certainly use evidence from the Unwen trial against him. And that was probably the intention, is to turn Unwen against the other commanders, to flip them. I don't know that for a fact, but that often takes place. It takes place a little less often in the ICC than in some of the other international tribunals where they have some more junior people that they're charging. But um, yeah, so I think if they had all of them, they probably would have just offered Unwen a plea and they would have had him testify against Coney and Oti and, and the others. What role does an acknowledgement of PTSD as a distinct condition, how is that changing ICC um, uh, prosecutions? Like, have, have you historically seen a change in that? Because um, you were talking about it in regards to this case, so I'm wondering if, if um, you know, kind of acknowledging the extent of that and understanding more about PTSD, if you see a change happening in the way these cases are tried? It's a good question, but in short, no. Uh, nobody has ever successfully raised a mental illness defense. At, at the ICC, I think at the other tribunals as well, there might, I think there might be one case, but I, I have to refresh my memory. But ICC, nobody has raised that defense successfully. Now there's another person, Al Hassan, who's also making the, the defense. And actually, they got the same prosecution experts, uh, mental health experts, and they testified completely differently than they did in the Unwen trial. And now the Unwen team has tried to introduce that into the appeal process. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were successful or not. I think we won't really know, actually, until the appeal judgment comes, but I, I don't think they were successful. But yeah, they've made very different arguments. 
which is I'm a little skeptical of these forensic experts uh, because it is it is very mercenary and they get paid for an opinion. Of course, they're supposed to be serving the court, but they get asked by a particular party, do you want, not just the prosecution, the defense as well, do you want to testify? And they, they're hoping for a certain result. And yeah, it, it's not, again, it's, it's just part of the adversarial system. I mean, it's, we see the same thing in Canada. So it's not that they're lying or that they're wrong, but they spin things a very particular way. So in, it goes into too much detail, I guess, but in, in the case of Ungwen versus Al Hassan, Basically, it's a, a methodological difference. So in Angwen, they said clinical uh, clinical interviews are not important because they weren't able to interview Angwen. He, the defense wouldn't allow him to be interviewed by the prosecution experts. Um, in Al Hassan, they said clinical interviews are the most important. <laughs> but anyway, and the judges don't know; they're not experts on, on these things. But but uh, something I didn't mention. Uh, but the standard in the Rome Statute, in Article 31, the relevant article, is that it has to com the mental illness has to completely destroy your ability to, to reason or to control your action. And if we compare with other domestic jurisdictions, it varies a lot, but that's quite a high standard. So you could definitely have all kinds of mental illnesses and not have or mental defects, is the other term used, and not have it destroy your ability to tell right from wrong. So, for example. Conditions that might cause emotional arousal. In some places, um, you could use that for mental illness defenses, but that wouldn't be sufficient at, at the ICC. So if the court had found that he had PTSD at the time of the crimes, he might still have uh, been convicted, you know, but, but they didn't say that he had PTSD. But that's also why dissociative identity disorder is so attractive, uh, to be blunt, because it's, it's kind of a long shot it's it's somewhat rare. It's a lot less common than PTSD, I would say. But that, you know, if you really have dissociative identity disorder, that really probably would destroy your ability to, to control your acts or to tell right from wrong. But they didn't get anywhere with, with that one. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for allowing me to try and use the, the tech here in a, in a slightly different way. I've enjoyed the talk, Shell. Um, I've been watching your work on Ongwen for a while now. I'm very impressed with the kind of uh, depth and, and uh, nuance that you bring to the analysis. So this isn't a critical question. It's really a question that arises out of my thinking more generally about the way in which researchers go about, in a sense, constructing the objects that they also at the same time analyze. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, you talked about context and the important, the way in which there's this kind of legal sort of suspicion of context, but how context really matters to understanding Angwin. And I'm wondering what work you've done in your research to foreground and in a sense kind of work through the specifics of your own context when engaging with Angwin's case. And I'm thinking here specifically that, you know, in North America, we understand the categories of child and say child so soldier by extension in ways that, for example, presume a kind of victim status or highlight vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. In other words, when we use that label, we don't use it neutrally. We have a whole kind of moral framework or context and a political context um, that's evoked through the use of these terms. I don't think this is wrong or anything, but I think children do tend to get understood differently as different kinds of beings in the world elsewhere, morally, politically. And I, when you work on Angwin, when you've tried to grapple with his childhood, I'm wondering what work you yourself have done as a scholar to acknowledge your own presuppositions about what children are, and also the way in which those presuppositions have shaped your, your, your approach and your conclusions. Thanks, Adam. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, and that, that is the, the literature on child soldiers is rife with that kind of image. And people have written about it, like Mark Trumbull, for example. The, I think he calls it the faultless passive victim narrative, the idea that child soldiers are always victims full stop, and it, it can be more complicated than that. Uh, and I think it was more complicated than that with Unwen. Like you saw that in, in, for example, the, I think it was in the closing statements, Unwen's lawyer, uh, Crispus Ayena, was referring to Unwen repeatedly as that boy. But he's, you know, he's sitting right there, a man who's about the same age as me, I think he's about 45. Um, actually, he's slightly older, I think. But anyway, he's about the same age as me, and he's calling him that boy, you know. So, and that's probably also a deliberate strategy to kind of associate Angwen, the perpetrator, with his his state of victimhood. But I think it's 
Yeah, I think it is important to interrogate, interrogate that in terms of how we look at children. And I think that my work does that. I mean, I think that there's a, a messiness to my work, which is, uh, I think, appropriate for the situation. I think it's, it's difficult to just adopt a narrative where he's fully a victim or fully a perpetrator. And, and I think you see that a lot in, uh, throughout the stuff that I've done. But yeah, it, I, I mean, on the other side of it, the kind of more legalistic side, of course, there's the idea that everything you do before you turn 18 makes you is, is a victim. And it could be your birthday, to use an extreme example, it could be your birthday and you could be committing all kinds of war crimes uh, and then, the, you know, one minute after midnight on your birthday, you're re fully responsible and, and two minutes before you're not responsible at all, uh, at least in terms of international criminal law, you might still be responsible domestically. Um, so yeah, it is a very tricky thing, I think. And you saw it in the trial, there are lots of, lots of interventions relating, especially in the appeal, there are lots of amicus curiae briefs relating to child soldiers and whether Angwen should have been treated more according to human rights frameworks versus criminal law frameworks, for example. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, that was really helpful. I mean, I suppose the worry is that the more westernized these conceptions are as they're mobilized through international law, the more removed international law seems from everyday experience in places such as parts of Africa. And this leads to, I think, suspicion of the kind of justice work that gets done through these court systems and court processes, and perhaps weakens the appeal of the court to victims who might otherwise want to have their cases represented there. So I think, you know, this, it's just a, it's a kind of broad worry that I have. But I think you answered the question really well. Yeah, and I, th I think the court is a pretty Western institution. I think no matter which way you slice it. Do you follow up on that? I mean, if you take it to the extreme, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, that uh, you know anyone under 18 can't, by definition, commit a war crime, it, it certainly makes young people even more vulnerable to those who would take advantage of that to avoid exactly being charged true. with war crimes, right? It's, it's and that's what a, people have said, that it actually provides a perverse incentive to recruit children actually, <laughs> although recruiting children is also a war crime, but yeah, they're not going to be held liable for, for what they do. I have this question. What is the role of drug usage in the indoctrination process? And if this can be taken as a defense, a legal defense? Yeah, not in the LRA, but in many groups involving child soldiers. Like for example, I, I, I spoke into many former child soldiers in Burundi and they were, yeah, to be blunt, I mean, during the genocide and during the, the atrocities in Burundi in 1993, they were heavily, heavily using drugs. But that was not the case in the LRA because the LRA was anti-drugs, anti actually. So these children were not using drugs. That's kind of a common misconception, like they were in, in many other contexts. They weren't even really using alcohol, but then later on, the rules around alcohol were relaxed. Uh, but Angwen would not have been using drugs. If he had been using drugs, that that might have contributed to his defense in a sense, but yeah, that's also a complex issue. Actually, what I was going to mention to you before I remembered, and I see you've got your hand up, Michelle, so I'll get to you too. But um, when also, you know, there was also debate in the trial about whether he tried to escape, you know, and as I said, that he should have tried to escape. I think he did try to escape. Uh, he certainly escaped at the end. That's how he came into the custody of the International Criminal Court because he was actually being detained by Joseph Coney and he escaped with, a, with the help of a guard. But um, yeah, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people around him and they, he certainly talked about escaping a lot. I don't think they're lying, but I also don't think it's, uh, it's not contradictory, or I should say people are contradictory, you know, that they might be very enmeshed in the group and thinking about escaping, but committing crimes at the same time and, and contributing to the group. So maybe we could quickly go to Michelle. I know we're- yeah. yeah, Michelle. Yeah. I was just wondering, do you think there was like an external factor that influenced the decision by the court? Because from a human rights perspective, I, I feel like it's the court's decision was a bit merciless, you know, like, and um, like, I understand like how, you know, the past experience can influence the person and the PS PTSD things. And so I was just wondering, like, was there an external factor? Because like, the person was also like, you know, um, pressured to get something done in that court as well. So 
Well, I think that was the external factor. I mean, how the case came to the court in the first place. And there was a lot of drama around Unwen's arrest, which has not been really reported, but he was in the hands of, of the Celica in Central African Republic, and he was with the Janjaweed. Anyway, there was a lot, there was a lot of stuff going on politically behind the scenes around handing uh, Dominic Unwen over. But um, I forgot the rest of your question that I was going to answer. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was okay. the, did um, I miss something? I think I did. I don't know what to do. I think the basis of it was, okay, the basis the basis was, yeah. it, was there an external yeah. factor that influenced, I think, yeah. the judge's decision purely based yeah. on, like, without them, like, kind of excluding the whole, like, like an abduction of child and kind of, like, force and stuff. I think yeah, that's, that's what you were trying to yeah, do. I mean, I, I think less so in the trial. I think the judges do take their job seriously, and I, they're coming from their own background, but I don't think they were under political pressure or anything like that. Um, but uh, I think that the whole, where you see a lot of that stuff is around what's called cooperation, you know, cooperating with states. Like, for example, Uganda, nobody was charged from the government side. And when you ask the prosecution why that's the case, they say the crimes were greater by the LRA. Um, but there, there are some problems with that. In, in truth, they didn't charge anybody from the government side because it would have made their life a nightmare in terms of actually trying to get evidence and arrest people. And that's part of the problem with these self referrals, I think. So that, that stage, I think, is very politicized, even though the court says it isn't, but the trial was so. Well, the bell has tolled one. And so that brings our first uh, brown bag lunch or lecture for this uh, year to a close. I'd just like to thank Dr. Anderson again for his presentation and to say that we are working on uh, future uh, brown bag lectures. The next one that's been confirmed is November 4th and uh, we hope to confirm one or two in October as well. October 14th is the next uh, okay, one with that. It's been confirmed October 14th and we'll be sending out information about that so please look for that. And thank you all for attending both here and virtually. Thank you.